Welcome back, pet parent. I'm so excited you're here today. I talk so much about the fact that we live in a very toxic world. And I don't think we can talk enough about it because it's just something that on a daily basis, we just we don't have the bandwidth to think about. So we kind of have to put in the effort, put in the work and run with it. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I am weirdly passionate about is the um, like shampoos and different grooming products that I use for my pets. Not for any other reason than most of what you find out there is incredibly toxic. Even products that we use on ourselves as humans, women especially, we, I mean, we're just loading our bodies up every day with endocrine disruptors. It's disgusting and um, it's very detrimental to our health. And what we do to our pets with a lot of the things that we're using for them can have similar negative effects to their health. So I had the pleasure of meeting today's guest at this uh, past Super Zoo which was in, when was that, August? August of 2024. Um, Michelle Allen, who if you're not familiar with, she's going to be on the podcast. She um, runs Monkey's House. And she came up to me and she said, this is the only woman that I trust with ever. Like she can literally send me a bottle of something with no label on it and say, try this and I will do it. And that just held so much weight with me that I was like, I have to go meet this woman. That's okay. So I did. And I'm so excited that you're here, Janine, with Project Suds. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell me a little bit about you and how you got in? You've been in Indie Pet since you were like 16. Yeah, I've yeah, so been in the industry my whole life. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. So for, for me, uh, I feel like I was born and raised in the pet industry, right? So as a little kid, I was uh, a pet store groupie. I hung out at my local pet store like forever, just staring at the animals. And then when I was 16, I got a job there. My absolute favorite job in the whole wide world. And I remember thinking, if I could do this for the rest of my life, I'd be happy. Uh, when I was 22, I opened up my own pet store. I still have it. So for 20 years, I've had my own pet store. But like I said, I feel like I was born and raised in the industry. Um, so being in the pet, store, uh, pet industry so long, I've watched the industry grow so much. Like it, it's amazing the leaps and bounds we've taken. And uh, I feel like our focus is always on nutrition. My focus is I'm huge on nutrition still. Obviously, it's a major point. But um, I was always focused on nutrition. And the pet foods have come in leaps and bounds of where we started. But I feel like the category, like you talk about, like topicals, shampoos, and everything has been overlooked forever, right? We, we're worried about organic food that we eat, which we should be, right? Everything we eat is so important. But we always forget about topically how it affects us, how it affects the environment. Um, it actually started because I have a uh, itchy pimple and um, Tana White, Mishka, love of my life. And uh, I fed her a raw diet, eliminated all the normal like allergens, like you know, no chicken, no beef, you know, to the best diet you can uh, get for a dog. And she was still itchy. And I remember thinking like, you know, this entire time, all I did was talk about nutrition. If your dog's itchy, it's, it's food, it's food, it's food, which is still a major part of why a dog's itchy. But there's the environmental side that I didn't think about. And until that moment, I always just thought it was food. And I'm selling all these products that I didn't really look into at the time that was marketed for like itchy dogs and everything. And I'm like, oh, just buy this. Nothing works. It is terrible. So I started doing research and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, all this time I've been selling these products that don't work. They're terrible. So I felt really bad. So I started I started creating my own products for my dog and um, really just uh, like fixed her skin issues. And started to realize like how bad that category is in our industry. They said we all are focused on food, which is like I said, major point. That's not something we should neglect or look over. But the other side of it, we kind of haven't looked into and kind of really didn't spend a lot of uh, like attention to. And uh, I started Project Suns because of this. So one one of the things that I wanted to do was be plastic free. Like you talk about the environment, everything, you know, and um I think that's such a huge problem is plastic. We're having now, we're finding plastic and everything. And we have to get away from that. Um, not only that, but like you said, the toxins that we absorb through our skin, we forget that everything that touches us, our skin's our largest organs and we absorb it, right? So we have to be careful what actually touches us and what's disturbing our microbiome on our skin and how it's affecting our dogs. The same with, like you said, how it affects you personally and what you wear uh, and what you wash your body with. But think about the groomers and how much daytime they spent 
washing dogs and how they're touching this constantly and how it affects their skin. I talked to a lot of groomers about it and they were like, my skin is like dry and disgusting from all these shampoos and stuff. So we just wanted to be uh, the best products on the market for our dogs, our health, our skin. And like I said, we wanted to be plastic free because that was really important to us. Well, yeah. So those are the two big things that I, I wanted to talk to you about today. One of them is being plastic free. So we can start there and then just how clean the products are themselves. Because sure. um, I think even when we have, and I, I've talked to different people in the pet industry um, who run different brands, mostly food brands, and packaging is an issue. And it's an issue yeah. for lots of different reasons. Like we want to be, I, I think anybody that takes a moment to think about it, they want to be plastic free. Oh, good. But getting there is a whole other story. And I recently talked to a brand owner who also wants to be plastic free, is very passionate about it, but she happens to have food and supplements and treats and things that run through distributors and they won't take it if it's in a glass bottle or if it, because it, it's, there's so much damage liability. So it's like there's so much to think about that the average pet parent oftentimes doesn't. But you and you're only an indie pet. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So how did you and I'm sure it's a very long story. You can absolutely like truncate this. But like, how did you one? What was your passion, your reason for wanting to be plastic free? And how did you get there with products like these? So. um in my own lifestyle, we're super eco-conscious, right? I have chickens, I have compost. Like, you know, and you're doing everything you can. And in the plastic industry, it, it, they pretend that everything's recycled. It's not recycled. Less than 10% of what you put in the recycling bin is recycled. Most of it just burns in the ocean somewhere. It's terrible. And, like, I feel like it's one of those things, once you know, you can't not know. It's like, this is terrible, right? And as a brand, you always want to grow. And it's like, if you grow and you are plastic, you're contributing to this. It's like just something that you can't be proud of, especially, like I said, knowing these things. It's like, you know, if you didn't know and you're believing it's getting recycled, you're like, no, it's okay. It's not a big deal. But you know it's not. So you can't do it. You can't be part of the problem that you know it's it. And, like, in my own lifestyle, I'm trying not to do it. So. I just couldn't produce a brand knowing it's going to grow and it's going to produce more garbage, more plastic. So it was just one of those things that it wasn't, it wasn't an option. It wasn't like, well, you know, I'll do it halfway or, you know, some of the line. It was just like, you just can't do it. It's just, it's just not an option. But there's so many hurdles to be plastic free. Like you said, it just, it is a very difficult thing. It's more expensive. And then the other thing is how things interact with uh, different products, right? So. Mm -hmm. We had to use glass for our four ounce because um, apple cider vinegar interacts with metals. So we had to do glass bottles. And then um, on top of that, it was how do you, the soap boxes. So our soap boxes are uh, cardboard and they're compostable. And when we first did it, we just did cardboard, didn't think anything of it. But natural soaps, uh, they tend to sweat sometimes depending on the humidity, the different things. And then we're starting to get oil spots on this. And it's like, oh, my God, now what do we do? You know, we have oil spots on our boxes. So we actually uh, found a, a natural wax to put on here. So it's still uh, postal boxes. But as you see things that you don't think of until you start going through it, that it's going to cause a problem, that would be solved if we could just do plastic, right? You just plastic on it. You know, you're like, it's done. And like I said, plastic-free metal glass is so much more expensive than plastic. So you have that, that other obstacle of like, is it going to be more expensive than other products on the market? So for us, we, we, something we couldn't compromise is, is, is the plastic free um, that we wanted to be. And then the second thing was cost. I didn't want you to choose something different just because it was cheaper. So what we did was we manufacture everything ourselves. We make it from scratch and keeps our costs down. And those costs are uh, passed along to the consumer. The other thing we did is because we're plastic free, we did all our all our uh, products are all concentrate. So what we're doing is we have one skew. It's one reusable block glass bottle and you keep this bottle. So everything we did, we don't use water. We don't want to sell water. We want to ship water. So you add your own water uh, at the end of it. So that actually reduced costs because it reduced packaging size and it uh, reduced 
the shipping weights, right? So everything's a lot smaller. So our four ounce plastic, uh, four ounce glass bottles are concentrate. They actually equal 12 ounces when the consumer gets it. So we're saving the cost of the extra sprayer that the customer would have to buy. We're saving the cost of shipping the water back and forth. We're saving uh, costs on the packaging size. We don't want to ship this 12 ounce bottle. We can ship a four ounce bottle. The other thing we want to do is show people what they're buying. A lot of products in the market right now are 98% water, 99% water. People buying water with shipping water is crazy. And we wanted to show people what they're buying. We're not shipping water. We're not selling water. All our concentrates are water free. So, you know, you add all the water to it yourself. And the flea and tick is one of the biggest ones in the market. If you look at a flea and tick product, it will tell you 98, 98. 99% 9% inactive ingredients, 99% of it, 98% of it's water. You know, they're just selling you water. Uh, we didn't want to do that. But there was like a lot of hurdles uh, to go through to figure out how to get it in plastic free containers and shipping, like you said, shipping was an issue. But I think because we're uh, the four ounce bottles are so small, shipping hasn't been an issue because of it. I'm sorry, I'm just going to know where this, the sun is, is leaving me. Um. Uh, shipping the shipping weight is is a lot better because we are shipping smaller containers, so that really helps. Because if we did have to fill up this bottle every time and ship it, this bottle is very heavy. So then that becomes a problem with breakage and shipping costs, and yeah, like the end consumer is going to have to deal with it, and the store is going to have to deal with it, and it becomes a problem. So getting rid of the water helped the plastic free uh, process. That definitely helped a lot, but it is a lot of hurdles. Is that it really is, and and one of the biggest hurdles for a lot of people is going to be cost. Uh, mm-hmm. Instead of that, you know, two cent, three cent bag that they're putting in plastic bag, if they have to put it in a metal or cardboard container, the, the packaging cost is going to go up a lot for them. Yeah, no, it it does make a a huge difference as as a manufacturer to try to, like you said, keep your end product costs what the consumer sees. Yeah. In a reasonable like amount, so that yeah. it isn't completely overlooked as like a viable option for them to be able to choose when they're shopping. Because the reality is, you have an incredible product. Um, I was looking at some of the products on your website and the ingredients in these products, and it's like, why can't why can't everybody do this? Like it's it's so funny because it's like we're going back to basics, you know, from our yeah. ingredients being super simple, and then the bar shampoo. Our bar shampoo is our favorite product, right? It's more economical. Uh, the price point great. It, it this is equal to sixteen ounces of liquid shampoo, so you're getting a value. It's smaller, and this is the original shampoo. This is what we used to always use, you know, before liquid shampoo came out. This is this is it, right? So it's funny that we're going back to it, but there's like a learning curve to it. Everybody's so used to liquid. They're like, how would you use a bar? I'm like, this is the original shampoo. We're just going back to what we used to do. And it's same with a lot of things, going back to basic, taking out the extra, you know, garbage we put into things and, the, you know, extra processing. You know, you, you go back to simple, like even the raw diets, right? Raw diet was the diet that dogs ate before kibble came, you know, and before kibble was canned food. You know, this is not, you know, go back to where we came from, where everything was simple. Yeah, well, and the, I mean, they're just clean um organic ingredients i just happened to pull up the organic shampoo bar with apple cider vinegar it's just a plain like that's where i always go i always go to like what's the most basic product that a company has and i start there because if that doesn't look good then you can throw all the bells and whistles in it you want i'm you know i'm not looking at so, I mean, you've got your organic oils, olive oil, coconut, shea butter, castor, which castor oil is something I have not talked about on this podcast, but I am in love with um, organic apple cider vinegar, cedarwood oil, um, clary say, like there's, it's, it's clean. There's nothing yeah, in super, there. I mean, we're super, it's super uh, proud of our ingredient list. Like when people ask, like, they flip it over to look at it. I'm like, look at it. It's the cleanest ingredient list you can find. Uh, organic oil is super important to us again, again, for just not only for our skin safety, but environmentally, you know, we don't want to put toxins back into our, you know, when we're washing it. This all goes back into the, the sewer system, into oceans and everything. Mm-hmm. So that was an important part. Apple cider vinegar is the main ingredient in all our uh, shampoos. That was like the a big part of what makes our brand different. I think that was a key ingredient that we use that's, that's been a game changer. Uh, as far as shampoo goes. Well, an apple cider vinegar is actually something that 
I I have been wanting to talk more about it and maybe you can help me talk yeah. more about it. Um especially with the world we live in. I think we first of all, like just to get throw it back to the very very basics. It is uh it's it's natural. It's something that we have used for ever and ever and ever as far as, you know, we know. And it it's good for to- I mean, we're using it topically here, but it's also good internally. It's it's just an incredible product. One of the things and I'm glad that you brought out the fact that you do want organic. Um that's one of the things that for me as a human, I I love my apple cider vinegar for keeping um, my blood sugar stable. And there's like, and it's like everything we find that's good, they want to attack it. And now, you know, there's all of these like apples that are having appeal and crap put on them. So yeah. why, yeah. like, tell me why, like a little bit about why you're choosing apple cider vinegar, why you're choosing organic and why it's like the highest quality you can yeah. find. So um, the apple cider vinegar topically, the, the benefits is um, it softens water. So any natural shampoo, I think our biggest enemy is hard water. Hard water breaks, it's very hard to break down with natural shampoos. It's just the way natural shampoos are. It just has a tough time breaking hard water minerals down. Uh, apple cider vinegar softens water. So it'll help break down that hard water, which like I said, is one of the our biggest things that we have to combat is hard water. Uh, the other thing, it softens hair. Um, it helps soften hair, soften skin. And it, one of the other things that I found always funny that I've always heard is if you don't get skunks, use tomato juice. I've always wondered what that came from because it was just the funniest thing. Like tomato juice doesn't make sense why I would put it on my dog. Uh, is the vinegar in there? Vinegar neutralizes odors. It actually kills skunk odors. So it will help remove nasty odors. And it actually helps dry the dog faster, too. A lot of groomers will use uh, apple cider vinegar rinse after the dog gets washed to help uh, dry them faster. So there's a multitude of benefits. The other thing is, um, like I said, with itchy dogs, uh, it will kill bad bacteria. It will not harm good bacteria. So it ke- keeps the natural microbiome on the dog's skin. It will kill fungus. So it keeps the skin super healthy, um, which is very important that we forget. I see a lot of shampoos, they, they, a big thing in the shampoos is chlorhexamine they're using in it, which is a very strong disinfecting chemical that they actually use in hospitals to disinfect things. So what it does, it disinfects everything. It kills everything. It kills the natural microbiome on the dog's skin. So the dog will be amazing for like a day or two. The third day, the dog's worse than ever. Uh, they need that to protect them from other things, right? They need those natural oils. So, but it seems like a miracle because like so the first two days, it killed all the fungus, any bacteria, whatever the dog issues had. But then the third day, the dog's drier than ever. Now, now more bacteria, harmful bacteria is attacking the dog and it causes other problems uh, down the line. So uh, we didn't want to do it, obviously. We wanted to do something that was going to help, you know, the long run of the dog, uh, keep the dog's skin healthy. And uh, with environmental allergies, the problem is you can't get rid of environmental allergies, right? If their dog's allergic to grass, pollen, dust, whatever it is, you can't eliminate it. We can do is wash the dog more often, remove the allergens without drying out the dog's skin. Because that was another common thing. Is, oh, don't bathe your dog too often, don't dry them out. It's because the shampoos we were using were drying the dogs out. It was removing the, dog, uh, the dog's natural oils. Like I said, our shampoos there to be that. You could wash your dog weekly, which is what I do, to keep her uh, skin perfect, especially in the summer and spring months. Uh, gets rid of all the allergens and her skin is softer, her hair is fr- like softer and perfect and no no itchy skin. I mean, if anybody has a bully breed, especially a light colored one, they're probably suffering through this too. It's like just the common thing. You look at a tan or white bully, you're like, that one has allergies, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. But it will it will remove everything and keep the skin healthy, which is obviously very important. Yeah, and I'm wondering, so I'm wondering two things. One, is it the combination of the apple cider vinegar with the other oils that you're using that um, is making it? Because when I think of apple cider vinegar topically, I never, I always am like, well, if there's like an open cut or open wound or they have some sort of sore, that might burn. But the the, the combination with the other oils, it's not going to burn, right? Like it's, it's yeah, going to be very so- soothing. Yeah, exactly. So you don't want to ever use apple cider vinegar directly in a wound. It will burn. 
Uh, but when we're making our shampoos, it's saponified in the apple cider vinegar. It's actually neutralized. So we're using apple cider vinegar and we're adding our lye into it, right? And it's and then we add the oils. So everything is completely changed. The apple cider vinegar and the lye neutralizes each other. It turns into soap. Um, so yeah, it, it's not the same as just directly putting apple cider vinegar anymore. When it's saponified in uh, the shampoos, it's like I said, yeah, it's completely different. It's nourishing to the skin. It's not going to burn. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's not the same as if you just put apple cider vinegar directly. So my other question is, do you do you use it for your hair? Yeah, I use it every day. I travel with it. It's the only thing I use. Um, it's funny because I started using it just, you know, just to test, you know, quality control. You know, always use something out of the batch, make sure everything's good. Uh, but now it's just, I, I don't like using anything else anymore. Now I just travel with it. And bar is the best thing because I can just throw it in the suitcase. But I really don't like using anything else. Like, bothers me if I have to use it. I, uh, another soap. I feel like I am the dry, you know. It just doesn't feel good. Yeah. Well, I actually, um, I tried doing the whole just, like, stop using shampoo, just do apple cider vinegar rinse, or, well, I then thought I was going to just try, like, egg whites, but I tried the apple cider vinegar, and I just did not make, I didn't even make it a whole week, because, you know, your hair has to adjust, yeah. and I just couldn't, I just couldn't, I'm like, I have to be on camera, I can't do that, <laughs> right? Um, so I never made it to the egg white to try the egg white, but I'm with, that was just pl literally just plain apple cider vinegar, which also I have very high, like my shower is kind of closed off with a glass door that's pretty high. So there wasn't great ventilation and it was also very difficult to break it when I sprayed it in my hair. But, um, that's just a side note. So, uh, yeah, now, because I was just thinking, like, I, I feel like I might use this on my hair. And a lot of people use it. People call me all the time. They're like, is this safe to use? I've used it. I'm like, I use it every time. I prefer the bar soap. I've used all the products, but I actually prefer the bar soap. And actually, a friend of mine, he has uh, eczema on his uh, skin. He says the only thing that cleared up is eczema. Yeah, he uses it all the time. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to do that, actually. I'm going to yeah, use it. Yeah, try it. On my hair. Um, and I, Dr. Dr. Judy Morgan and Gwen, they use it. They called me up. They're like, oh my God, I just use this. I love it. <laughs> she was yeah. like, yeah. I, um, and I have used the bar on my dog. And I will say, I was skeptical at first um, because I'm like, okay, it's a bar of soap. How it, like it, and I know, being like all of the training I have, the kind of person I am, I am very much aware that suds are like, marketing right like we doesn't have to sud to get you clean but still in my brain i was like how is this going to work how is this going to get her clean and it was amazing i loved it like it was a really wonderful product and i was really sad when i was at the end of my bar and i'm like okay now i need to now i need to get some more um and so i just wanted to say that for people like i know that it it did suds i did sud a little bit like it it isn't crazy like a um, shampoo, like a regular chemical shampoo that you're yeah. going to buy at this, at the store. But, um, it's still like, and then you have, you have other products as well. So yeah. there's the shampoo, which obviously is probably like your, I assume it's your main product, but then yeah. you yeah, have, it's it's yeah, you're in skincare, you have, um, flea and tick products, which, uh, can we talk a little bit about the flea and tick products? Yeah, because sure. So the flea and tick, the flea and tick is interesting because it's it's regulated by FIFRA. FIFRA regulates label requirements on flea and tick. So if you ever notice on flea and tick products, they all use the same oils. FIFRA puts out a list of oils that you're allowed to use. I personally don't think they're effective. I don't like them. Or I think some of them are a little bit hot oil. It's not like it's not really effective. Neem oil for me, I'm a huge fan of neem oil. There's like so many uses, but one of the best uses for us is as a natural insecticide. Organic farmers use it. They they put neem oil out and pasture on the cows and everything to keep fleas and ticks. That's how good it, it is. And again, for organic farmers, they can't use pesticides, right? They can't use chemicals. Uh, so it's super important for us to use it. But FIFR will not allow you to say kills or repels if you use neem because it's not on the approved oil list. So to get around that, we did uh, uh, our flea and tick says, um, don't have a bottle in the room with me, but it says um, flea and tick Hardly. itch relief. Yeah, right. it's an itch relief on it just to get around that because, like I said, it was important for us to use neem oil. I think it's one of the best oils, one of the safest oils to use. 
Um, and then we use apple cider vinegar. There's a lot of talks about apple cider vinegar, how it's a natural uh, insecticide too. The, the bugs don't like the smell of it. So those are the two main oils we use in our uh, clean and sick product. But we did use uh, was like, so any essential oils, there's two things because there's a lot of talk about essential oils being toxic. Mind you, I've never been in the industry of life. I've never seen a dog go to the vet because it got too much peppermint or got, you know, lavender oil. But there's a lot of talk about it. But two things with essential oil is quality of essential oil. And so I think one thing happened was when essential oils became really popular, there was uh, essential oil sold that wasn't pure essential oil. I think it was cut with something and maybe those are causing problems. Um, so quality of essential oil is really important. All our essential oil is the highest quality essential oil. A lot of people say therapeutic grade, but therapeutic grade is not a real grading. Essential oils don't have like, like your, your organic certifications. We have organic certifications. It's a grading system. This is what's required to be organic. Uh, essential oils don't have that. So I don't use that therapeutic grade because it doesn't really mean anything. There's no, you know, grading system to it. Uh, but our essential oil is the highest quality. Everything's human grade. Our peppermint is actually edible. Uh, you could use it as a flavoring for people. And all of our essential oils, not only that, they're all tested for impurities, right? Before we get it, we get a little uh, uh, sheet saying it was tested. This is, you know, everything's safe inside of it. And the other thing about essential oils is dilution ratio, right? We're, when any time people are talking about it, are they talking about quality essential oils and what dilution ratio? We're not putting uh, 100% peppermint oil on the door. We're not putting 100% lavender on the cat. All our essential oils are used in less than 1% ratio. So it's it's one percent of diluted bottle when it's done. So it's in a very safe dilution ratio. And uh so even though our neem and apple cider is the main ingredients that's really repelling or killing um pest uh pests, we use peppermint, uh lavender and namely oil just to round out the smell because if anybody's familiar with neem oil, it doesn't smell that good. And then you then not that but we use apple cider vinegar, which doesn't smell good either. So it's like these two things that are like these smell the work. And this is what we're going to use the main ingredient. So we're trying to round it out. So with the, the mix of oils uh, made it so it doesn't, it's, it's, it's a pleasant smell. It's not offensive anymore. But like I said, it was very important to use uh, the, the neem oil for us. So that's why we said the, the label requirements did make us put ishram leaf on there. And we're not allowed to make any claims about kill mm-hmm. or repel. But we do talk about how farmers are using, you know. That's awesome. I, I absolutely always for me I always want to go to like more natural especially at first you know like I never want to run to something harsh yeah first right away yeah um and essential oils are such a passion of mine and I so like always anytime I get the opportunity to and I just was talking to somebody yesterday because they also were like I was recommending an essential oil blend for their dog and they're like are you sure it's okay and I'm like I think I'm sure it's okay. And explaining to them about more often than not, like there's a there's actually a pretty pretty small list of of oils we wouldn't want to use on our pets for various reasons. But like more often than not, anytime you are going to see issues arise, it's because it's not a true essential oil. It's actually yeah. a fragrance, or yeah. it's a very poor quality essential oil, or maybe it was cut with something because it's yeah. not from a great company, or you know, there's there's a lot of that going on. And I think for that reason, most veterinarians are just like no to essential oils because they can't, it's just too much to try to educate themselves and then educate their clients on what's a good essential oil and what is not and how to differentiate. Like it's it's a whole, you could, there are literally people that that's what they spend their whole life doing um, with essential oils. So get that it is i think it's because it's unregulated like i said we, we you know put out these terms like you know these fake grading systems that aren't real uh and i think that's where the problem is right essential is very expensive so if like walmart selling you know four ounces of lavender oil for ten dollars lavender oil lavender oil is so expensive you know yeah. so i think that yeah you're right that's where it came from they're cut with something and they're selling who knows what's in it you know and that's causing yeah. a problem absolutely um so there's also in your catalog, a section called ear and skin care. And I kind of honed in on the ear cleaner, which looks really cool to me. Um, that's another thing that I get asked a lot about cleaning, like cleaning your dog, sometimes your cats, mostly your dog's ears at home and, um, you know, products that are good 
to do this with because again there are so many products online yeah. to buy for this and most of them I just cringe at but tell me a little bit about your ear cleaner so uh, uh, same thing going back to basics right <laughs> made it super simple the two things I can't stand to see in the ear cleaner is water and alcohol and I see it all the time it's like a water base I'm like you realize groom is spent like the whole day trying not to get water in those ears like that causes ear infection and then you're just inserting water which is madness to me uh the other thing is alcohol alcohol burns alcohol burns if you dog already has a problem with his ear alcohol is absolutely going to burn his ear and it's already sensitive issue that's why the dogs freak out and you know people try to clean their ears um so we want to be obviously we don't want to use water we don't want to use alcohol we use witch hazel witch hazel helps dry out the ear so if uh, the dog has any water in the ear, which is will help dry it out, get that water out. Uh, it doesn't burn. You have to get cut, but which is well, it doesn't burn. Uh, so it's great for sensitive issues. Uh, we use neem oil. Uh, neem oil, again, it pesticides, so it be in mites or something that will help. Uh, but neem oil is just great for the skin, too. Uh, we use naive oil. Naive is like uh, not talked about oil. It's kind of like the cousin to tea tree oil. Uh, it has the same um, antibacterial, antimicrobial, uh, but it's not considered a hot oil. Because uh, a lot of people are really against tea tree oil, so it's mm -hmm. like a softer, softer version. Uh, so we use that, and then apple cider vinegar, same thing. Antimicrobial, antifungal. It's a, just a great, uh, great thing to clean out. But the main ingredient is still going to be the witch hazel, because like I said, we didn't want anything to stink. So it's a very diluted. Uh, it's witch hazel, and uh, less than one percent of all of essential oils, and uh, in a small percentage of apple cider vinegar, just enough to get the. Uh, any like uh, bacteria or fungus to kill that without stinging the dog. Awesome. I so when I met you at Super Zoo, you actually I'm gonna grab this really quickly. You gifted me a candle, and um, it's candles are hot topics for me. Um, I happened to take the. I'm gonna try this. I, I'm I'm such a white girl, and I know I am. So I. It's Coco Limon. You can smell better than I can. I'm, I, I don't, yeah. Anyway, it smells absolutely amazing. I was not ready to let go of summer. And this is like. It's bringing you back. <laughs> oh my gosh. It, yes. Um, but candles, candles, plugins, air fresheners, these are really hot button issues for me because one, your pets can't get away from it. Like, if you're spraying, especially if you're going through your whole house and spraying, or you have candles in every room, or you're putting plugins in every room, heaven forbid you're putting a plug in next to a litter box like that. Oh my goodness. But it drives me up the wall. One for the fragrance, because it is so overwhelming to, as a very sensitive, I am a very sensitive person. I can, like, anytime I walk past anything, past somebody that smokes, like, I, smell it and I gag. I'm just very, very sensitive. And I know our pets are even more, they can smell so much better than we can. But on top of that, they, um, the fragrances that they're using are very detrimental to all of our health. Our pets metabolize, they're so much smaller than we are. Um, our cats have different meta metabolic pathways than us and that our dogs do. And it is, it's creating a really toxic environment in our home. So if I when anytime I talk to like my own clients, I'm like, we got to get rid of whatever is in your house as far as like candles, plugins, air fresheners, all of that. But there are some, not very many good products that we can bring into our home. And when I looked at your candles, I was like, okay, I can actually like burn this in my home and not feel bad. Um, so tell me a little bit about your home line and... <laughs> Yeah, why why it's so wonderful. So one of the main things it has to be soybeans, right? You, uh, you can't burn anything besides like actually beeswax. So soy and beeswax are the only ones that I would burn in the house. It's a clean burn. If you ever use a, a paraffin wax based candle, you have that black smudge. That's disgusting. Yeah. That's sick. It's it's gross. It's oil, right? It's just burning oil. Um so yeah, we use soy base, we use cotton wick, so it's a very clean burn. Uh the other thing is fragrance, right? So fragrance is a dirty word uh, because everything can be hidden in it, right? There's no, again, you know, like no regulations. You put fragrance, put whatever you want in there. Um, for us, we use a phthalate-free fragrance. Phthalate is found in a lot of fragrances. Phthalates are, again, another dirty burn. When that burns, it's an oil or it's actually plastic. It's what they make plastic with. So it's a 
dirty, toxic thing that's burnt. So we use a phthalate-free fragrance. Everybody acts as us if we use essential oils in our candles. And there's a couple of reasons we can't. So I would love to, right? But uh, one, essential oils, when they're burnt, is very different than being diffused. The same thing when when our oils are spotified, it changes what it does, right? Like coconut oil, if you just use it topically, super moisturizing. Once you saponify it in our soap, it's one of the most drying, cleansing oils you could use. Same with essential oils. So if you diffuse it, you can still smell. It smells nice, beautiful. If you burn it, it becomes, some of them become toxic and they do not smell good. So it's just not something you can do. The other thing is the, um, uh, I'm blanking on the word. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm blanking on this word. That's okay. I if can it heats it. up too much, uh, if it heats up, it's, it will, uh, go on fire. Blanking on the word for it. But, uh, flashpoint, the flashpoint of essential oil. That's what it is. Flash point of the scent, certain essential oils is too much. So it's dangerous, right? So if you put essential oils in it and it did smell great and it wasn't toxic, you found a little bit, you know, one that you could do that would be safe, uh, the flash point is too low. So uh, it could, the whole thing could just go on fire. So those are major reasons why you can't use essential oils in candles because I, I, we obviously use essential oils. Why don't we just use it in candles? Uh, those three reasons we couldn't use, we couldn't use essential oils. So we did find a, uh, the cleanest fragrance you can find, like I said, is phthalate or natural fragrance that uh, we use in our candles. That's that's awesome. And you also have the um, water-free, um, I guess they're pellets to make your own yeah, room so, spray. Yeah, the, uh, our room and pet spray. So like you said, trying to get away from uh, the chemical air fresheners. Yeah. I can't stand them. Well, the plugins, like the same thing as you, right? I like. I think they're disgusting. I find them offensive. Like if you spray an air freshener, like this, this is vile. Uh, so we did... Uh, to make this plastic free, this one was a difficult one to stay plastic free. We wanted to use essential oils. And the same concept is uh, essential oils at a very low dilution ratio, right? So uh, what we did was make, it's almost like a bath bomb. Um, it's a bath bomb consistency. It actually fizzes up when you drop it into the water. And it releases the essential oils and it makes a spray. So this actually, this little vial right here will turn into 12 ounces of a uh, room or pet spray that you can spray on the dog. Uh, said, same thing. This is super small, super compact. Instead of shipping 12 ounces of water, we're just going to show you a little bath bomb and a little vial. You throw it in, you can spray it. We're marketing it for, uh, you can spray it on the door of a cat. And it's completely safe. But we're trying to get people to get away from the air freshers, the plug and spray it on the dog's bed, couch, wherever the dog lays on, uh, get rid of the odors that way. Awesome. So the other things that I'm seeing kind of um, highlighted on your website is that a lot of the products, maybe all, are they all, there's a lot of products in here, maybe not all of them, are also cat safe. Um, so do you, because so many companies, they really just are all in on dogs. So I appreciate when people are like, these are also good on cats. And yeah. I think that's because you're using such clean products. Yeah. So um, a lot of them, um, yeah, especially unscented, we left a couple of products unscented, marketed for cats. Um, we use anything but our lavender. It's marketed for the cats. Yeah, a lot of things we we try to make. Most of the products are uh, for dogs and cats. There's only a few that we just kind of left it just for the dogs. Yeah. So you've mentioned a couple of times um, groomers, and yeah. I am I happen to have had. Gosh, it's probably been two years ago now. I had a groomer. Her name is Cat Henshin. Um, she had a salon called Plant, uh, Platinum Paws and literally just opened her new salon called the Ninja Groomer. Um, and she really opened my eyes to a lot of things in the grooming world. I still don't take my dog to a groomer. I groom my dog myself at home, but I know that's not the case. That's not the reality for a lot of people. Um, so it seems like you have kind of a, a pretty good knowledge of what goes on with or probably because you've made these products like these are designed with our pets in mind but also with the pet parent or the groomer in mind so is that some is this something that you think is um reasonable for a pet parent to when they are talking to their groomer or interviewing a new groomer to I mean, obviously, we want them to be asking about the types of products that the groomer uses. But for me, I'm that kind of person that's like, 
do you use these products? Can you use these products? Is that something, is that like a selling point that you want people to be like, ask your groomer about these products? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we actually sell groomer gallons that uh, can be diluted for the groomers to use because obviously this, you know, the, the little bottles would never, they'll go through, you know, pretty fast. So we do sell concentrated gallons for the groomers. Uh, but we do have some groomers um, that obviously use our gallons. And then uh, a couple of groomers use our bars because the customer is actually excellent. They brought in the bars. They're like, got to use this on my dog. So, yeah, you can't. You just actually groomer just bring it in a bar and tell them to use it. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. awesome. And um, so, yeah, it, it was just very interesting for me to get to talk to Kat because I had such a bias of groomers. I had only really known um, about like the huge big box pet store grooming and that just always made me like cringe. And I'm yeah. like, no, I'm not doing yeah. that. Um, so getting to talk to her and I bring that up because obviously she was on the podcast. So um, if if grooming is a sore spot for you, please go back and listen to that podcast. But I always like to kind of um, invite the listeners to talk to their independent pet stores. Like when you go into an indie pet store and you have an item in mind that you're looking for and they don't carry it, to talk to them about it. And I and since I asked you earlier, like this is a product that is found in indie pet stores, um, you know, talk to them about it say hey i really would love to buy this product can you stock it can you special order it for me is that like does that work for you can we can we yeah. promote that a little bit <laughs> yeah, of course i mean yeah, i have a, I have a better pet store and yeah mm -hmm. anytime people ask for a product sure because i mean like that is, is sometimes the, you know pet store owners don't know about the product or um they have limited space right you can't carry everything you know so oh yeah it's your pet store if you, there's a brand you want just ask them they'll be get it for you i mean most you know most stores would get delivery four or five times a week trucks and stuff they could throw whatever extra stuff you wanted on them that could answer yeah. them so what is your indie pet store where is that in the it's in new jersey yeah yeah in Clark, new jersey what is it called animal crackers Oh my gosh, that's so cute. Yeah, it's funny because we've been in business for 20 years. And uh, when I started, when I started 20 years ago, our focus was live animals. Like, we sold more birds, more baby birds, more hamsters than anybody else in New Jersey. It was like wild, right? And I'm the, like, I love going to the store and one of my favorite animals are there. You, know, you take them out, you play with everybody. Uh, but the industry has changed so much over the years. Like I said, we the focus is like completely live animals. Literally, that, you know, that's the only thing we focus on. And, uh, for the past 10 years, we don't have live animals anymore. We're focused really majority on dog and cat stuff and nutrition. Uh, for our diets, or can't have enough freezers in the store. Uh, but the industry has just changed, you know. It's just like, like kids don't have, like when I was a kid, I had, you know, I had lizards, I had a 10 gallon fish, I had a guinea pig hamster. You know, the kids, they, they don't really have any live pets anymore. And that's where, you know, that that was, that was our clientele it's little kids you know we set hamster races hair curve races you know uh but that's kind of like it's unfortunate because i feel like i learned so much from my, my animals learned about ecosystems and everything but uh unfortunately it's gone away you know covid brought it back a little bit but it's still not like i think they're just kids are more into electronics and stuff mm -hmm. uh than they are about live animals i never thought about that but that is a very good point and i think is i mean so very true I um I was traumatized as a child from all the different animals we had. Not like I mean in a in both a good and bad way. Like it it is very traumatizing to see certain things. Like I had a a pair of hamsters and I, I didn't know anything. Apparently had a male and a female and then the they had babies and then they like ate the baby <laughs> and I'm like oh my god. Like, oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I was literally. I was a child. I was. Oh my god. Um. But I mean, it also it shapes you as a person. Like these are things that. Okay. Yes, that was traumatizing. But also, like, it's it's real. It's life. It's a. It's also a learning experience. And yeah, our kids kids today just aren't getting life lessons. Hey, yeah, they don't have any more. You know, I, I, I guess it, it's unfortunate. Like, you know, it's it's it, like, I don't know, when the last time you saw a live animal at a pet store? Have you walked into a pet store and seen a live section? No. That reminded me, though, that, like, apparently I had a lot of 
trauma with hamsters because when I was even younger, we came home one night and, I, and we had kittens and they got in the hamster cage and there was like blood all over the walls. I had a lot of trauma with hamsters. But no, no, I don't see live animals. I mean, I also am not, I'm kind of intentional about avoiding that. Um, I see like there's still fish in it, the big box stores, I think. Just big box, and even big boxes now are down to like a very small oh. percentage of their overall oh. stores. Uh, but most of independent vet stores, I haven't seen uh, really live animals anymore. At yeah. All. yeah, it's definitely a specialty thing. My step uh, stepson has birds, and that's definitely, I think, like that's a specialty. But oh my gosh, birds are a whole like. You have I I you need a PhD to raise a bird <laughs> and a very long life, very yeah, long life. I mean, it's great because people who, who got our birds, we, we used to hand raise all our birds, right? You sold a mm-hmm. bunch of cockatiels, um, and there's people who still have our birds. They're like, hey, you bought it for you, you know, 15 years oh, ago. I still God. have it. Yeah. Oh so. wow, wow. Um, yeah. Well, that's definitely something. If you get for your a child, that you're going to wind up with that for a long bird time while your child yeah. goes. And oh, does all college, high yours. Yeah, and college. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's yeah. yours. Yeah, it's yours. It's your pet. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm I'm really excited about um having. Well, for first of all, just the cleaning products. That's that's a big deal to me. Having um cleaning products that are clean. And then also having the added benefit of being, you know, eco-friendly with no plastics. That's that's a big thing for me. But I'm also very, very excited for the home line because that, to me, and I I know this is probably, I mean, not an unusual thing for me to, for people to say, but it's just not something most people think about. But as someone who works like one-on-one with clients, for women especially, it's very difficult to get them to get rid of fragrances in their home. And yeah. it's always something that I talk to people about because it, it, especially when you have an animal that is already sick, that is immunocompromised, yeah. they have some sort of chronic illness going on. Like we have all these things, like their liver is already overloaded and then you want to add all of these chemicals into the air in your home. And, yeah. you know, it's, it, it is difficult, especially for um, I think the old, you know, little son of, it's kind of like the older generation of women, but I think it's coming back with like Gen Z. I think they are very into, you know, all of the like bath and body works and the, you know what I mean? Like that. Oh, really? It's coming back? I, I feel oh. like it is. I feel oh. like they're very into the like trendy kind of, you know, bringing all of that retro stuff back. The I, I, back. I, I know. I know. I know. As long as, yeah, there are definitely some things we don't need to bring back. But, yeah. um, you know, they brought back the fanny packs. They brought, I mean, they're bringing all the things back. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I I have the um, body suits. They brought back body suits. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it is. It's difficult, I think, for a lot of people there. It's like. This is this is one little thing that I have in my home. You know, it makes me feel good. And I'm like, okay, but we need an alternative. And these are some really great alternatives. So I just yeah. Wanted- yeah. I mean, yeah, like, exactly. We can give them alternatives too. That's funny because we just started expanding uh, our cleaning line. So we have our dish soap. Uh, and then we just came out with, uh, did I show you at Super Zoo? We, we did come out with a uh, uh, stain and old remover. Oh, um, you might have. I didn't see it on the website, and I so I forgot. No, we didn't put it up yet because we we still have it. Like, you know, we showed it at Super Sale, we, and uh, we just started shipping orders now, so we didn't even put it up because we're you know still trying to ship the orders that we have for it. Oh my but uh, it's uh, a vinegar base because, like I said, vinegar major part of our product line. But we use white vinegar instead of the apple cider as a cleaner because I think it's one of the best cleaners. Right, you go back to basics. We, you know, everybody's, you know, vinegar cleaner. It's, it's great, safe. Um, but what we did, again, to stay plastic-free, we did a concentrate. So because we wanted to dilute the vinegar down to a certain ratio, we did a very high concentrate uh, vinegar. So average vinegar in your house, if you just buy it, it's about a 5% concentration. Uh, mm-hmm. We did a 10%. This way, when you dilute it, it gets down to the dilution ratio you should have it at. And... Um, the same with apple cider, the vinegar smell, is especially a high concentration vinegar, like I said, it's, it's double your average one that you have in your house. If you think that's strong, this one's even stronger. 
Uh, we use thyme oil. Thyme oil uh, kind of knocked out that vinegar smell. Again, trying to combat the, the things that we pick. It's like, why do we do this for ourselves? Uh, so we use thyme, peppermint, and lavender shot to round out the smell. So uh, once it's diluted, it has a, it has a nice smell to it. Because it's like, you, you know, you want that clean smell, but it's like, you don't want to use fragrances. And going back to like being easy, like we could put a, a, a synthetic fragrance and cover it up, no problem. Uh, but we didn't want to do that, you know? So um, we, we took a while. We playing with a lot of essential oils to get that one. So you said covering up, covering up vinegar has been, been a tough one. <laughs> been yeah. A tough well, and I, I think you get used to it. That's one of the main things I use to clean in my home is white vinegar. Yeah, so you're familiar with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get used to it. And it's, it is the only thing I've found that, you know, works well on stainless is, yeah. is white vinegar. Um, especially with like the fingerprint marks yes. that you're always seeing. It on, works great. On, it, it's yeah. like the best cleaner. It is. It's. I also use it um, instead of fabric softener in my. I don't laundry. use any. Yeah, I don't use any fabric yeah. softeners. Oh, that one's a big. That one's a bad one. The uh, fabric the fabric softeners or the dryer sheets. The dryer sheets oh, are really bad too. People okay. don't realize how bad dryer sheets are, and it's like just toxic things going into the air. It's really dryer sheets are a big no yeah. for me. Yeah. Oh yeah. They are. I don't. It's been quite a while since I stopped using. I just do. I just do the wool dryer balls. Mm. I mean, yeah. I'm. Cause I'm just not gonna do those, especially for my pets. Um. And I feel like if I were a parent, I would be doing it for my kids yeah. too. You know, like mm-hmm. they can't. They're not making these. They can't make these choices for themselves. We have to do it for them. And I. I just don't. I mean. I just don't want that on their bedding, on the, yeah. you know, blankets and the sheets and things that I'm, that I use for them. Like, I don't, I don't want them to be toxic. Yeah. So, yeah. I yeah, appreciate well, that. The, yeah. The, well, my, my, my little people with G had allergies, man, I, like, I tore up everything. Like, anything this dog could touch, anything I washed our dish with, the floors, everything. I was like, nothing's touching this dog that could cause an issue for her. Yeah. And she's good now. Yeah. She's perfect. That's Love awesome. My life. Yeah. I love that. And I saw her picture on the website. So um, if you want to see a picture of her, please go to um, Project Suds with a Z, projectsuds.com. Um, and where else can people, so ask for this at your indie pet store and um, where can people, can they also order online? Can they Yeah, they can order you? direct from us. Yeah, Dr. Judy Morgan's website also has it. Um, but any, any uh, local independent pet stores, that's like I said, our focus. One of the biggest reasons we want to do focus on independent pet stores, besides that's like, you know, for me, it's my heart. So I think that's where like the pet industry gets our education. Like that, that's where the value is, right? Like yep. the, the independent pet stores are giving the consumer the education. They're doing the research on products. Uh, but because we're focused on itchy dogs, if you don't give the dog the right diet, our, our products won't help. So, you know, you, you know, if you just bought this in Target, if you need pedigree, even like it doesn't work because you're on the wrong diet. So it, we're really a compliment to good diets, right? So independent pet store is going to fix your, your, your diet with your dog and uh, we're going to fix the environment's allergies. That's awesome. And where can people find you to follow you on socials? Uh, Instagram. We are uh, project underscore suds on instagram um and the same on facebook wonderful well janine it was so nice to talk to you i'm really excited about this product i'm glad to get um more people like bringing awareness to it and alternatives to some of the most toxic things in our homes because you know it's just one thing at a time do one thing at a time and this is you know, if you're already spending money on shampoo and conditioner and air fresheners and candles, just spend it more wisely <laughs> in a better place <laughs> for better products. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. All right, guys. I will talk to you next week. Bye.